So for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Axelman. I'm a member of the board of the Young Lawyers Chapter based out of Tallahassee. And it's my privilege to introduce the moderator for our second panel discussion, Alexandra Geyser. Uh, Alexandra is the Director of Regulatory Affairs at River Financial, which is a Bitcoin company. Previously, she served as the youngest ever Executive Secretary at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, where she worked directly with former Secretary Mnuchin. She also has private sector experience, having worked in the Washington, D.C. office of Aiken Gump and clerked both for then-Justice Allison Ide of the Colorado Supreme Court and Judge Jennifer Elrod of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, finally, Alexandra earned her law degree from the University of Texas. And I think this is where we'd usually make a Florida's better than Texas joke, but I have not been able to come up with anything clever so far today. So instead, I will simply turn it over to our moderator. Uh, thanks, David. I'll make the joke for you. It's because there's no intellectual comparison between Texas and Florida. Um, <laughs> so as you all know, this is the Florida Young Lawyers Conference. Uh, and so I suspect most people in this room have been looked at as the person who is morally responsible for understanding cryptocurrency in your current job. Uh, if you don't already, hopefully this panel will help you out on that. So I'm going to introduce um, our very distinguished set of panelists. Please know these are abbreviated introductions. They have done uh, many, many impressive things that would take the duration of the panel to say. Um, after that, I am going to give us all sort of a quick level set overview of a handful of terms in the cryptocurrency discussion and a very high level overview of some of the regulatory issues so that we can then jump right in. Each of our panelists will have um, set comments and then we would love to open it up for Q&A and have a really robust discussion with everyone in the room. So without further ado, uh, today we have Professor Julie Hill, who is the Alton C. and Cecile Cunningham Craig Professor of Law at the University of Alabama School of Law, where she teaches banking and commercial law. She previously practiced law in the D.C. office of Skadden. She clerked for Judge Wade Brorby on the uh, 10th Circuit, and she holds her undergrad degree from Southern Utah University and her law degree from BYU. Next, we have Sujit Raman, who is the general counsel at TRM Labs, a leading blockchain analytics firm. He was previously at Sidley Austin and an associate deputy attorney general at DOJ. Um, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, he's a graduate of both Harvard College and Harvard Law School and attended the University of Bristol as a Marshall Scholar. We've got Andrew B. Samuel, who is counsel at Davis Polk and is currently seconded to Coinbase in their global regulatory policy team. He was previously at the Bank of England's Financial Stability Division. He holds a bachelor's degree from Yale and a law degree from Columbia. Finally, we've got um, George Seldrin, who's the Senior Fellow and Director at the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives at the Cato Institute and Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Georgia. He has written many, many books, the titles of which are all interesting and compelling, uh, and he holds a bachelor's degree from Drew University and a PhD in economics from NYU. So to kick things off, uh, when we talk about cryptocurrency, typically we mean four big buckets of things. I'm actually going to switch to the other mic because this one is structurally unsound. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, so typically, when people talk about cryptocurrency, they're going to be referring to one of four buckets of items. The first is Bitcoin. So this is the OG cryptocurrency. It kicked off uh, the blockchain as a new technology. And I would say it is actually the only cryptocurrency that really fits the definition because it is really trying to be a currency. Um, most other things are not. 
Second, we've got Ethereum and sort of the DeFi space, maybe Web3 pretty broadly. So this is decentralized finance, a lot of smart contracts, trying to automate things to take out intermediary institutions in transacting. Third, we have stable coins and CBDCs, or central bank digital currencies. These are pegged to existing currencies, and so they're supposed to hold value. Think of them as the on and off ramps for the highway of cryptocurrency. Um, CBDCs are, as the name would suggest, controlled by a central bank, while stable coins are typically controlled by either a private company or an algorithm which is usually controlled by a private company. Um, finally, bucket four, we've got altcoins. So this is your Solana, your Dogecoin, uh, your Monero. These are optimized for a lot of different use cases. Uh, typically, just being currency isn't one of those use cases. Um, and so this is the bucket where when SEC Chairman Gary Gensler talks about a lot of crypto is actually a security, it's he's probably referring to something in the altcoin space. I'd say there's sort of a fifth category, non-fungible tokens or NFTs. Those are not cryptocurrencies, but if somebody's talking about digital assets, that's usually the four cryptocurrency buckets plus NFTs. So again, I, I think the compelling definition of a cryptocurrency is that it is a decentralized, digitally native currency that is secured through cryptography. The decentralized plus crypto cryptography piece is what uh, we refer to as the blockchain. So blockchain is what it sounds like. It's a long string of Legos. Each Lego contains information. Typically, um, at least in Bitcoin, when you talk about mining the coin, you are adding blocks to the blockchain and in exchange for the computing power and hard work, you are rewarded with the currency. Other altcoins have different functions. Um, you might have heard of an initial coin offering or an ICO. That functions pretty differently from mining. But again, these are all kind of just ways to get the currency. Um, very quickly, a lot of people will say this is a totally unregulated space or it's the Wild West out there. This is only sort of true. Um, River Financial, where I work, is a brokerage. We are regulated in all 50 states and the territories as a money transmitter. So yes, it's Western Union, MoneyGram, and River Financial. Um, it's very much a square peg round hole, but we have all collectively agreed that this is the square peg for this round hole. Um, at the federal level, the, all of the existing bureaus and their existing jurisdictions apply. So the IRS taxes cryptocurrency. Uh, FinCEN goes after crimes committed with cryptocurrency, as does DOJ. What people mean is there hasn't been a wholesale review or whole of government refresh on how are we going to, to determine specifically whether something digital is a, is a security, is a commodity, is something totally different. Um, and so instead, what you've seen with a lot of companies, um, BlockFi sort of took the ask for forgiveness approach. Coinbase took the ask for permission approach. Um, Grayscale has been trying to issue an ETF for Bitcoin for a long time. Everyone has been slapped down. Um, and so you've gotten kind of dubious regulation by enforcement, particularly on the SEC side. But that's not to say there is nothing. It's just that what we have is instead sort of an ill-defined patchwork. So uh, with that, I'll kick it off to Professor Selvin. Oh, I get to go first. Can you all hear me? I didn't think so. Oh, maybe now it's on. OK. So I thought the red light meant off or stop. <laughs> That's why I'm not a traffic cop. I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step way back in my remarks uh, uh, to, to take a broad view of the whole question of the legitimacy of private currency, because I think that that, uh, that legitimacy is often questioned. Uh, certainly by regulators, but by economists as well. Uh, and I want to particularly challenge the widespread belief that uh, 
private production of currency of any sort poses a threat to uh, national sovereignty. Uh, so you might call this a, 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 a kind of meta-legal approach to the subject of cryptocurrency, a, a, a background approach. And I want to start by pointing out, first of all, that, that the currency and money generally, they're not, they are not originally creatures of the state. Uh, money is not an invention of the state. We don't know exactly where money starts, but there are certainly examples of very primitive monies that don't seem to have involved any government uh, uh, in interference or regulation or monopolization. Uh, the first coins, as far as we can tell, as far as uh, anthropologists and numismatists can tell, were not uh, products of any kings or princes or uh, what have you. And um, it's also true that most of the improvements that have taken place in currency over time, the things that are generally recognized as having improved upon earlier forms, have been private innovations, not government in innovation. And the simple reason for this is that governments uh, have tended, when they've involved themselves in making currency at all, have tended to monopolize it. And guess what? With monopolies, you just don't get a lot of innovation. So innovation has tended to come from without, often in the form of challenges to those monopolies. This has been true throughout history. Paper money, for example, even the earliest in China was a private innovation and the state took it over and within I think a couple of decades, this was a long, long time ago, you had the first Chinese this hyperinflation, uh, which is also difficult. Uh, and finally, of course, governments have not perfected uh, currency. Uh, the, certainly, I, I, I think uh, I needn't belabor the, the evidence of this. <laughs> uh, now, what governments have done, as I suggested before, is to monopolize currency production. And uh, they've done this since ancient times with monopolies of coinage. But the overarching reason for these monopolies, historically, uh, hasn't been to protect uh, uh, the public from the abuse of currency by its private suppliers. It's been so that the governments could abuse currency themselves for fiscal reasons as a way of gaining revenue and gaining it quickly if they had to for, by debasing the coinage and that sort of thing. Uh, the historical record up to relatively recent times and for some nations to this day makes this fiscal, the importance of this fiscal revenue motive abundantly clear. You only have to consider the record to see that. It was medieval schoolmen who first sanctioned these abuses and the privileges that uh, allowed them uh, by enshrining them in this notion of a sovereign money prerogative, as if uh, uh, ha having private suppliers uh, produce alternatives to official money was on a par with their staging a coup or something like that. So coining uh, without government authority was long treated as a treasonous offense subject to capital punishment, which certainly wouldn't be the case if it was a mere uh, instance of, of uh, contractual, uh, 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 a contractual crime or something like that, uh, uh, offense. And this was true, by the way, even when the coins produced didn't pretend to be authentic or government products. So um, what I think is uh, very sad from my point of view as an economist is that uh, to their everlasting shame, economists in general instead of challenging government currency monopolies, uh, as they've challenged all sorts of other government prerogatives dating from medieval times. The coinage monopolies were accompanied with salt monopolies, with soap monopolies, with monopolies in all kinds of things, which economists have always condemned and which have, for that reason, mostly disappeared. But the economists went along with coinage monopolies, despite knowing the record of their regular abuse, uh, and did so mostly on the basis of completely phony theories, theories that just don't stand up. An example is Gresham's Law. 
Gresham's law you've all heard of summarized as uh, bad money drives good money out of circulation. Well, it's, it's a law that those who have studied it know, and I've studied it quite a bit, is a law of what happens when you have government-imposed legal tender laws that protect official monies against substitutes or uh, that are used to force people to accept debased versions of former official monies. It's not a law that applies when you have open competition and coinage. And we have all kinds of proof of this. In, in those rare instances in which free competition in currency has been allowed, we see not bad money driving good money out of circulation, but quite the opposite. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, although, of course, as you know, the Constitution gives Congress the right to coin money and regulate the value thereof, until some years before the Civil War, private coinage was also legal. There was no law against it, no federal law anyway. And uh, because of that, and because of the limited nature of U.S. mint facilities, private coinage did take place in the United States. Uh, at first, there was only a mint in uh, Philadelphia. So when the Appalachian Gold Rush took place in the 1830s, uh, it was very costly and risky to send the gold to be coined to Philadelphia, so private mints sprung up. And guess what? Some of them produced products better than the official products of the U.S. Mint, and they flourished. In the 18, uh, uh, 1849, 48, 49, and for a few years later, same thing happened in California. There was no mint on the West Coast, so private mints sprung up. And guess what? Some of them had shoddy coins. Some of them had good coins. But we know which ones survived and prospered, the ones that had coins that were, if not uh, just as good, as U.S. mint coins but were better, were actually had, on average, higher gold content. Perfectly, these were dollar coins, by the way. They were all based on the official unit, and that was fine. That was what you would expect. Okay, I could tell you similar stories, if I had time, about private paper currencies. You only hear from economists about the terrible wildcat banks and their currencies of the period of the 1830s and 40s and early 50s. What you don't hear are two crucial facts, that regulations were actually the main reason why those currencies were as bad as they were, and some of them were awful. Oh, you also don't hear that there weren't that many outright fraud frauds. Uh, but the other thing you don't hear about is the many instances of successful private currency systems throughout the world, which continued to exist in some places right up until the 20th century. The economists don't talk about those, and I'm afraid most of them don't even know about them. But they were highly successful private currency systems, currency is issued by commercial banks, and I am almost done, uh, in, uh, in uh, places like Scotland and Canada and elsewhere. So. What we're witnessing today, and this again, this is just to give you background by which to you know, uh, uh, deal with the rest of what we want to talk about today. We're witness witnessing yet another a digital version of, of such an episode where we have private firms doing an end around the government monopolies with a new innovation in currency that is still uh, proving its worth. And uh, so far, this episode suggests that good monies drive, tend to drive bad monies out of circulation if you let competition take place. We see this very clearly. We've seen this very clearly in the stablecoin industry. It isn't the good stablecoins that have gone out of business. It's the obvious frauds. And, uh, and the ones that are flourishing are the ones that seem to be the safest. Circle coin uh, is, I think, the best example of this. It's been growing and growing and growing at the expense of others, and uh, it's backed by high-quality assets, or so they say. Okay, will Bitcoin prove to be another successful rival to established official currencies? That remains to be seen. Uh, but unless it's imposed un unwillingly on people, it can do so, it can succeed only by proving to be at least as convenient and safe and presumably more so than those official monies. So in any event, 
My aim isn't to, uh, to champion Bitcoin now or any other private currency. I just want to ask that we don't allow medieval notions of monetary sovereignty, a word that itself should warn you that this is not necessarily something we should approve of in a modern republic, uh, to prejudice our thinking about this important topic. Thanks. Thank you. Professor Hill. So as George indicated, um, one of the reasons that people sometimes like to regulate new currencies is in order to maintain the monopoly for the government. Um, but I want to talk about cryptocurrencies and how we might regulate them or how we regulate them now. Um, just, I mean, I'm a professor, and so, of course, it's my natural state to not actually say anything, but just to call on you folks and make you do the work for me. Um, this seemed like the wrong uh, setting for that, so instead, I'm going to give you questions to think about as I talk. Um, so the first question is, is there a reason to regulate in the first place. And I, as George has suggested, I, I agree that maintaining a government monopoly over currencies is, should not be one of them. Instead, um, plenty of economists would say, well, what we should look for is some sort of market failure, perhaps fraud, some folks say money laundering, but you also hear some other justifications for regulating cryptocurrencies. One that you hear often from banks is, well, we need fairness in our regulatory structure. So we shouldn't allow cryptocurrencies to run around unregulated when we foist lots of burdensome and onerous regulations on banks. Um, uh, I feel for banks that and they at times have argued that they are onerously regulated. Um, but again, it, it, that seems to me... Uh, it's a consideration, but but not a reason necessarily to adopt the status quo. Another reason that you've heard, especially in the last few months, is that folks are losing money. Um, certainly, we can't have folks out there losing money. Um, we must stop that. We must fix it. Um, life must only be roses. Um, you know, perhaps your life works out better under that philosophy than mine. But I want us to be sort of critical about the reasons that we think that we might be regulating cryptocurrency. The second question I want you to think about is, OK, so we found a problem that we would like to regulate away. Do we realistically think that we can adopt a law or regulation or with a court case do something to improve the situation? Just because there's a problem doesn't mean that the government is the answer to it, I think. Um, some problems are sort of intractable, other times regulations impose unintended consequences, and sometimes um, there's just no good way to go about doing it. In the early days, as cryptocurrencies liked to think, I think, that they were unregulatable because they were decentralized and there was no sort of intermediary to act um, as someone that the government could twist the arm of. But these days, with the rise of wallets and exchanges, there are certainly intermediaries that can be um, regulated. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they should be, but it's something to think about. And then finally, and lastly, which I think is something that will be uh, near and dear to a group called the Federalist Society's Heart, is if we do think regulation is warranted and might perhaps work, who ought to be doing the regulating? Should it be the federal government? Should it be the state government? Or could it even perhaps be um, uh, industry regulation like we have to some extent in the security space. Okay, so what are we doing now to regulate cryptocurrency? Well, this could be way longer than I should probably talk for, so I'm just going to give you what I think are some of the highlights um, that kind of impact questions that um, I think the Federalist Society would be interested in. So what's the federal government doing? Well, I would say that they have generally been pretty slow to act, except that from the very beginning, they've been clear that if you make money on cryptocurrency, you should pay them. Um, <laughs> you know, taxes, they love taxes, and there must be ways to collect taxes. And while I don't necessarily have a problem with people pay paying their fair share of taxes, um, I think that there is some concern that the desire to collect taxes from cryptocurrency might um, 
impose onerous data collection um, and give the federal government access to lots of information. Um, so I think that's one space to watch as um, the government tries to collect more and more taxes in this space. Um, we want to make sure that uh, civil liberties aren't being um, impacted. The second way that the government has sort of gone about regulating cryptocurrencies is not that they've, you know, had Congress pass a law or even that someone like the CFTC or the SEC has come up with some rules and regulations that say, hey, if you do this, then X, Y, and Z. Instead, they go out, they look around, they find someone doing something they don't like, and they tell them that if they don't stop, there will be consequences. Um, so, for example, uh, Coinbase announced that they would were going to have a product um, that uh, called Lend um, that involved people being able to deposit cryptocurrency and make interest while that cryptocurrency was being lent out. The SEC decided it didn't like that. It. it uh, I, as I sit here next to the Coinbase guy, um, uh, if he throws something, um, we'll know I got it wrong. Um, but uh, they said, look, if you do that, that's going to be some sort of security and we're going to investigate and um, it will be bad. And so uh, Coinbase on Twitter says, well, we don't think it's a security. Um, shortly thereafter, they say, well, we're not going to do Lend anymore. The Wells the Wells notice, which is, you know, we're investigating you, um, is still hanging out there. In the meantime, we still don't have really any clear picture of what the SEC thinks of security is. Does, how do we, we're using pretty old tests that were designed to be applied not to crypto assets. Um, you know, they could be much more upfront, and if they were, People would know that when they were making their plans, when they were designing. It costs, we all cost a lot of money. Um, why should lawyers get rich off this? I mean, except us, of course. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think as we regulate, we want to think about, even if we've decided it's, it's the role of the federal government, um, to think about the way we do that and to make sure we do it in a way that will be even-handed, transparent, and subject to um, scrutiny and review. Um, and then sometimes the federal government regulates in such a way that they give advantages to established businesses. So recently there's been some talk of stable coins because as it turns out, some stable coins aren't so stable. Um, and so one of the ideas being floated by the Biden administration is that only banks should be able to issue stable coin. Well, you know, look, um, banks do many great and wonderful things, but they are not the pioneers in the crypto space. Um, and so to the extent um, that the government might prefer to regulate actors that they're already familiar with, our regulations might actually stifle the innovation that would lead to new and better currencies. Okay, so if the federal government's not really um, doing a, a bang-up job on regulation of cryptocurrency now, we might think maybe this is a place for the states. Florida, for example, has said we would like to be um, the Bitcoin center of the world. Miami has said that on numerous instances. Governor DeSantis says he's going to figure out how you can pay um, your taxes with Bitcoin. Um, but it's not as easy for states as just saying, hey, we like crypto and you know, we like business and come here and life will be good. Um, and Florida found this out because they had a, a case that was really throwing a wrench in their crypto um, business. What had happened is they had, I, I guess, a fellow who was a, a drug dealer, but he sold Professor Bitcoin held two minutes. undercover uh, to a police officer. And then they charged him with operating as an unlicensed uh, money service business. And so this made it so that basically any two-party transaction was involving Bitcoin was illegal unless you had a license from the state. So the legislature, with very little debate um, and broad support, changed this. But it's not simply a matter of showing up. Um, Another state that's tried to be quite crypto-friendly is uh, Wyoming. 
and they've passed in the last several years more than 20 different crypto related laws but they've also found that it's not simply just a matter of opening the doors to crypto one of the things they've done is create a charter for a special purpose depository institutions, people that would take your cryptocurrency and just hold it for you and then give it back to you when you want it. And so they chartered a few of these as banks, one for Kraken. But the federal government has said that these banks are not allowed to have access to the Federal Reserve's payment rails. So they can't easily transfer US dollars between banks. And this is a real stumbling block for these. So even though Wyoming seems to be friendly, it might depend on the cooperation of the federal government for these types of businesses to be able to flourish. Um, and I didn't even get to talking about the, the, what the government might do if they decided to adopt uh, central bank digital currencies. But suffice it to say that there are all sorts of federalism issues that are, are tied up with a government entering, perhaps as a monopolist, um, this space. So I'll, I'll leave it there and I don't know who's next. Yeah, CJ. Well, thanks very much, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, and it's actually really interesting to be part of a conversation on regulation of crypto, because I actually came to crypto. My, my crypto origin story is in my capacity as a regulator, which is uh, the ultimate form of regulation, which is criminal prosecution. Um, and so I was an assistant U.S. attorney for many years. And this is probably 2015 or 2016. I was sitting in my office and one of my buddies down the hall came by and said, you know, we're looking into this thing called Silk Road. Have you ever heard of this? And I said, well, Silk Road, 13th century trade, Central Asia. <laughs> and he was like, no, 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 like the digital Silk Road. And that's when I learned for the first time about this incredible illicit marketplace on the internet, on the dark web, where people were freely transacting in drugs, weapons, hits, you know, literally, you know, murders on people. I mean, it was incredible. And it was out there if you knew where to look for it. And the FBI was deeply integrated into what the Silk Road was doing. And so ultimately, uh, as many of you know, the Silk Road prosecution turned into this huge thing. The Dread Pirate Roberts was the guy who sort of ran the, 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 the protocol. He was you know, uh, charged with all sorts of crimes, was convicted, I think is now serving a life sentence uh, in federal prison. But that was my first acquaintance with crypto. And so I think most people, like me at the time, associated crypto with illicit activity. And so as I sort of made my own way in my own career in the Justice Department, I was starting to see a lot more of the use of crypto for all sorts of illicit uh, uses. And so when I ultimately served in leadership at the department, um, I helped oversee the cybercrime function at DOJ, I'd have prosecutors, I'd have agents, I'd have supervisors coming to me and saying, look, we need to do something about the dark web and sort of how people are interacting with cryptocurrency, because this is something that is completely unregulated. We do have criminal statutes that apply in particular contexts. We need to have an enforcement strategy when it comes to crypto. So we did a pretty holistic assessment of how cryptocurrencies were impacting our investigations um, in many ways, as, as you know, as you all know. Law enforcement is sometimes at the cutting edge of a lot of technical innovation, not because law enforcement is particularly technically savvy, but because they're following the criminals. And the criminals are often extremely innovative when it comes to uh, using innovative tech. And so we started seeing that crypto was being used in ransomware payments. You know, we were experiencing really in the last four or five years a great increase in uh, ransomware, which I think everyone here is familiar with. And typically, ransomware was being demanded in crypto because of the perceived anonymity. We'll talk about the anonymity or the pseudonymity in a minute. But that was one area where, for somebody responsible for enforcing cybercrime statutes, we were seeing a lot of activity. We were seeing a lot of activity, as I mentioned, on the dark web. People trading child pornography, doing all sorts of illicit things using crypto, which it would be much harder to do on the open internet because of the ability of law enforcement to surveil or to sort of monitor what was going on. We were seeing the use of crypto in money laundering, right? So not just the underlying illicit activity being illegal, but let's say you've already committed a crime, trying to use uh, mechanisms outside of the traditional banking system 
to launder your proceeds. Another area where we were seeing a lot of use of crypto. And finally, towards the end of my tenure at the Justice Department, I left in 2020, we were starting to see the use of crypto for sanctions evasion. Again, rogue nations, whether it's North Korea, whether it's increasingly Russia, whether it was China, North, you know, other, other nations, Iran, obviously, which was under a very uh, deep sanctions regime, uh, using crypto to try to evade the mechanisms that had been set up by the international financial system to, uh, to regulate what they were doing. So from the federal law enforcement point of view, there was definitely use cases for crypto, and there was a need for the federal government to become more organized in how it was investigating and prosecuting crimes involving cryptocurrencies. But something that I realized in my, my leadership role was that, yeah, there is an illicit sort of uh, use of crypto, but there are also tremendously liberating uses of crypto. The sort of use, the, the positive use cases which is often overlooked or forgotten in the public conversation. And so that's what I'm hoping we spend a little bit of our time talking about today, are what are the sort of positive use cases of cryptocurrencies, of distributed ledger technology generally, of the blockchain, you know, distributed databases. There's concerns about you know, illicit use, but there's also many positive uses that as we think about regulation, we need to make sure we're not unduly stifling or sort of stepping in the way of. And before I conclude, let me just offer some five, four or five general principles or characteristics of crypto that distinguish it from traditional financial uh, transactions. Number one is the immutability of the blockchain, right? Essentially, once you engage in a Bitcoin transaction or any other kind of cryptocurrency that's on a, on a public blockchain, it is immutable. You can't reverse it. It's done. It's hard coded. It's cryptographically sort of in the, the distributed ledger. Now, that has, you know, potentially negative issues. If you get scammed, if someone, you know, persuades you to part with your crypto and you didn't mean to, too bad. It's going to be very hard to get it back. But on the other hand, if you're in the law enforcement business, the immutability of the blockchain helps you trace illicit transactions. So the Colonial Pipeline incident, which everyone is probably familiar with, the ransomware, sort of pseudo ransomware attack on Colonial Pipeline, Colonial Pipeline paid the ransom, and the FBI was actually able to recover a substantial percentage of that extortion payment. Why? Because they were able to trace where the money went and then secure the keys and get the money back. So immutability cuts both ways. The borderless nature of the cryptocurrency sort of network, right? On the one hand, it creates concerns if you're a sovereign government trying to enforce your laws, can people evade those laws? On the other hand, what more liberating idea is there than money that transcends border? If you've got relatives in other parts of the world, and you don't want to be paying extortionate fees or kind of middle, you know, middle payments to a bank or a central institution. If you can transact money directly with your cousin in Australia or Indonesia or wherever with no transaction fees and do it immediately, that's a liberating thing. That's not a that's not a scary thing. I mentioned earlier pseudonymity. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on these concepts, but you know, transactions on the Bitcoin network, talking about Bitcoin because it's the most prominent network, are not fully anonymous, right? Your Bitcoin wallet has a string of numbers and letters. It doesn't have your name attached to it, so that gives you some layer of, of pseudonymity. But on the other hand, because of regulated exchanges and other areas where there are sort of touches with the fiat uh, environment, you can get know your customer information and link particular wallets with particular individuals. Typically that's law enforcement, or it's the business that has that information in its custody. But that is one area where, again, you can have some anonymity, but also not the total anonymity that might lead to sort of scary outcomes. Um, finally, I'll just mention something about unhosted wallets. So an unhosted wallet is essentially when you custody your own crypto. You don't share it with an exchange. It's not, you don't have a third party in charge of it. Again, getting back to the original idea of money, there is nothing more liberating than the idea that you custody your own funds. Your money is your money. You own the private key. Nobody else can take it from you. Like that's in some ways a truly liberating idea. But here's the other side of it. You know, when you have totally unhosted wallets, when the money is completely in your possession, let's say it's illicit funds, how does a, a legitimate party like the government seize it? Right? If the passcode is in your own mind or it's in your own sort of custody, 
it's very difficult for legitimate you uh, legitimate third parties to take that money away from you so again issues that are uh in the public conversation that we should be talking about but uh have not really fully been resolved so i'll stop there i know there's a lot more discussion to be had I'll turn it back over to our moderator all right awesome thank you andrew sure uh I'll do my best to keep it snappy because I can see that the, this room is just burning with questions that you guys want to <laughs> ask. Um, so yeah, I thought to give a little bit of a, a global perspective based on what I'm seeing in my role, thinking about you know Coinbase's operations you know across the world, and rather than giving you a jurisdiction by jurisdiction laundry list, oh, the EU is doing this, Australia is doing that, I figured that would bore you. So instead, we're going to talk about it a little bit more thematically. Um, one thing that I think we're all in agreement on in this room is that. You know, free markets should be, uh, you know, any government intervention should be justified in some way or another. Uh, I think crypto is pretty interesting in terms of how it raises these issues because it's adjacent to financial services, which is a very highly regulated industry. But at the same time, any given crypto startup, most likely they think of themselves as a tech startup. It could be you know, one person or a very small number of people who actually end up having to talk with lawyers or seek legal advice at a much earlier point in the, in the life cycle of a company than you see in any other industry, which is fascinating. And I also think it's a reason why government regulation potentially could really stifle innovation here, because there are just not going to be that many young companies that have the resources you know, to hire expensive lawyers like us to, to think a lot of this stuff through. Um, so thinking about the main questions that countries around the world are considering in terms of how to regulate the crypto space. Uh, broadly speaking, I think every government has the same basic set of goals. You want to protect consumers, you want to maintain financial stability, you want to prevent financial crimes, and you want to promote innovation. Like pretty much every country out there is trying to do the same thing and figuring out what the recipe should be to make that happen. Basically, there are two questions that each government needs to answer. And I'll say one is, where do the rules bite? Like, who are you actually regulating? And the second one being, what even is cryptocurrency? Let's let's talk through those real quick. Uh, so on the first, that actually is a bit of a difficult question because financial regulation as a general matter applies to intermediaries. That's why my esteemed colleague, Professor Hill, uh, mentioned just now, you know, there's a thought in some corners that crypto might even be unregulatable, right? Uh, distributed ledger technology does make it possible for the first time to transact at a global scale without any kind of intermediary. So that's potentially revolutionary. Um, what are the categories of answers, right? What are the different approaches that people are taking in terms of how you address that problem, that there isn't necessarily an intermediary there to regulate in the first place? Uh, one is you regulate the users, right? You say, well, it's like regular folks who are buying and selling Bitcoin who should be regulated. I, I think as a general matter, that's a bit ridiculous, right? Can you imagine each individual holder of a stock or something like that having to deal with the entire body of securities regulation? It's, it's, it's untenable in practice. Um, another possibility there is you say, well, it's not really decentralized in the first place. There's someone actually behind the curtain somewhere. Uh, to some extent, that sort of is the position being taken by, by Gary Gensler, at, uh, our, the current chair of the SEC. Uh, you know, I think what it leaves out is that there actually are some cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin most notably, that genuinely have grown beyond the ability of any one individual or group of individuals or even institution to control. Um, I'll also say that it fails to recognize that decentralization actually is a process. Like there was a time when Bitcoin existed only on the computer of Satoshi Nakamoto, right? <laughs> this pseudonymous maybe fictitious inventor of it. Um, but as people started using it more and more, the community grew, the value of it grew, and now it exists in a way that it just lives freely on the open internet. It isn't the kind of thing that you could try to regulate someone, but you wouldn't be able to regulate Bitcoin in its entirety. Um, the last of the, the potential categories of approaches, which seems to be the one that I think most countries are coalescing around, is basically you, you regulate the touch points between crypto and traditional finance. So if you look at something like an exchange, you know, like coin, uh, Coinbase's business, for example, what they're doing is taking money in traditional forms of money, fiat currency, like, you know, a credit card, bank account, that kind of thing, and allowing people to buy and sell different cryptocurrencies. That's 
one place where you might be able to to regulate. There are also money transmission um, money transmission laws. Uh, there are legal frameworks that can be used to govern that, and I think there that's probably where co consensus is coalescing. But most countries are still at a fairly early stage in terms of the development of their of their regulatory frameworks for crypto. Uh, the second one, the second major question that every jurisdiction needs to answer is like, like what is it? Like what even is it? <laughs> um, and to that end, I think I, I want to speak a little bit about you know the fact that there are different types of cryptocurrencies. You know, uh, as Alexandra mentioned in our intro, uh, partly I want to respond a little bit to some of the shade that's been thrown on stable coins. All right, uh, <laughs> right. So you know, George, you mentioned uh, USDC, right? Um, which is uh, the second largest stable coin by market cap. And you said it's backed by good assets, like, or so they say. Right? Um, and uh, uh, Professor Hill, right, as you mentioned, <laughs> it's like uh, some stable coins are not so stable. I think this is actually a good example where we have a chance to break things down a little bit, right? So uh, USDC is a stable coin that's issued by Circle, it is backed entirely by US Treasury securities maturing within the next 90 days and cash on deposit in a bank account. Um, I think most people would regard that as very safe. It's a credible risk profile, and they do publish um, monthly like attestation reports from an independent accountant, basically to say, look, like here are the assets we have backing this. Whereas the term stablecoin is often applied very broadly to a large number of things. I think many in this room might be familiar with Terra and Luna, which blew up in May of this year. Right, Terra was was backed by essentially nothing but a tautology. Right, uh, you can issue one coin <laughs> and say, well, it's convertible into coin. Uh, well, you can issue one coin and then you issue a second coin, and you just say, well, this one's convertible into this one at a fixed ratio. Uh, well, it's like, well, what gives that coin value? It's like coin A is valuable because you can convert it into coin B, and it's like, well, what gives coin B its value? Well, it's value is that you can convert it into coin A, right? <laughs> and that's it. Right? <laughs> There's a vast difference between that kind of algorithmic, uncollateralized stablecoin and something that is genuinely backed by, you know, like I said, cash on deposit at a bank plus US Treasury securities. Um, that example kind of got to me, right? But there are others, right? So um, one being, uh, if you were to say, okay, I've got a company, I want to raise stock instead of IPOing it. Uh, instead, I'm just going to issue a token and people buy that token. That'll be a way for us to bring money in. I think most people would agree that actually that's not legitimate. Like we have a certain set of we we have a set of rules and we have a process in place for a company that's seeking to raise funds and do an IPO. And you shouldn't just be able to issue a token and get around that, right? So I think securities is one body of regulation that could apply. Of course. Payments and, and banking type regulations is another set of rules that could apply. Uh, the last one I wanted to put out there is uh, we do have a set of rules around commodities. And I think that's one that many jurisdictions are considering as well. Gold, precious metals, they are commodities, right? And I think the big difference between securities and commodities regulation is just in securities, you care about the issuer, right? Like if you're going to be buying a stock, it matters a lot to you what the financial performance of the company who's issuing that stock looks like. Whereas if you're buying a commodity, you don't care so much about the the the, um, the source of it. So if I'm buying oranges, for example, I care, are the oranges good? I don't really much care about the household balance sheet of the farmer who grew the oranges. Um, that may also be one promising regulatory path in terms of thinking through what frameworks under existing law uh, could we make use of for different parts of the crypto world. Andrew, you've got two minutes left. Um, we have mics set up um, in a couple of spots, so feel free to go ahead and line up. We really would love Q&A. Word. I figured there would be some questions, and I wanted to, to yield some of my time to get Very good. have a chance to engage more. All right. Right there. We'll start it up. Hi, guys. So I would just invite the panel to think about and talk about the potential irrelevancy of the U.S. regulatory regime. I mean, in, in the crypto world, it's trivial to, if you're going to incorporate, incorporate offshore. Most of the biggest DeFi platforms are immutable contracts, which means that even if you did regulate them, there's, the computer is immune to the regulation. Um, 
and developers probably have a First Amendment right to publish code. And so I really wonder if all of this talk about regulation is kind of interesting in the vacuum, but you look, for example, in Wyoming, no one's taken advantage of the Wyoming Dow law because it's useless. And I really wonder if all of the stuff that we're seeing in kind of U.S. regulatory stuff about crypto is, you know, a lot of noise signifying nothing. So we're River Financial is is a U.S. company, and we are sort of following the slow and steady path to offering our product in all 50 states. Uh, Nevada and New York are our two big holdouts. So to professors to Professor Hill's point, um, both the federal and the state structures really do make a big difference. I think, um, you know, I, Andrew probably could speak more to the global setting, but you don't find significantly more favorable regulatory environments in, say, the EU. And so in some sense, I would say uh, the U.S. financial system works sort of in spite of itself, um, I certainly think there's a lot you could do to make it more efficient, uh, more fair, more fair to market entrants um, instead of protecting market incumbents. So I think critiques are, are welcome and probably accurate. Unfortunately, there's not a clear, better option, at least um, if you're in this space right now. I guess I would add to that, and I do think it's an excellent question, right? Um, I think there's a big difference between actually rendering something impossible versus um, making it inaccessible for mainstream users. Right? So you're quite right. Code lives on the internet. Anyone who's got a VPN, even if something's ostensibly blocked in the United States, could just you know could tunnel around it and get access to it. But the fact is, the vast majority of, of consumers are not in a position to do something like that. They don't even want to do something like that. I think they just want to be able to use and access a platform that works. Like, if you think about banks today, for like actual banks today, um, we have an incredibly complex body of banking regulation that exists, but it exists for the purpose of ma making it possible for ordinary people to just be able to take for granted that their money is safe and that it's going to work. Right? I think that's the real value of having a well-designed regulatory regime in place is that we would make it possible for people to access crypto-based financial services in the United States and to be able to do so in a way that allows them to take for granted that they're not going to get scammed and that there's someone keeping an eye out on their behalf. If I could, I'm sorry, just add yeah. one very quick, I thought it was an excellent question. You know, one thing we are seeing is a lot of the financial innovation is starting to happen in other parts of the world because of uncertainties about what the regulatory climate is here in the United States. So one example I would use, you think about centralized sort of CBDCs, right? Um, central bank digital currencies. So China has been very forward leading when it comes to the development of a centralized sort of digi you know, digital currency. It's part of their Belt and Road Initiative. So they're essentially rolling it out in other parts of the world. If you want to contract with the Chinese government, you've got to start using our attributes, our standards, our tech capabilities. And if we don't get our act together here in the United States, the danger is that other parts of the world are going to adopt essentially the Chinese notion of the internet. And that is an unmitigated disaster for all of us because, you know, you think about how the internet developed in the 1990s, really led by the United States leadership, openness to ideas, free speech. There are all sorts of problems with the internet as it, as it has evolved over time. But the, at the end of the day, the internet is an American technology infused with American values. The danger that we have is that this sort of web three idea of and sort of the financial aspects related to it could be developed in other parts of the world that do not share our values. And the world is going to look in a very different kind of way 20, 30 years from now, unless we are much more assertive about how we infuse our own values into this emergent technology. Great. And I was just going to jump in. I heard um, part of the argument that um, you know, First Amendment protects code, um, and so therefore we can do whatever we want. Um, maybe that's not your argument, but certainly some folks take it that far, right? Um, so I just wanted to remind us all that the First Amendment's there, yes, and it does protect speech, yes. Um, but, you know, speech is not protected when it crosses the line to action, so you can't yell fire in a crowded building. 
Similarly, you can't create code that um, does something that would be illegal. And, and so also, it's generally the expressive nature, right, of speech that that is protected. So if you're making some sort of political statement, maybe that's protected. If you're using your Bitcoin to fund your political contribution, maybe that's protected. But that that's different than if you're using your Bitcoin to hire hitmen. At least I, I assume that's the DOJ's uh, <laughs> <laughs> position on that. So, um, <laughs> so I, I think we want to be careful as to how far we take our speech. I mean, it's probably clearly commercial speech is not very expressive, and to the extent um, it crosses into action that's illegal, we could have problems. All right. Good morning. Uh, thank you, everyone. An excellent panel. Uh, Closer I'm, to the oh, mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, my uh, question, uh, like the panelists' thoughts on the territorial battle or uncertainty between the CFTC and the SEC, which way they see it might end up going, especially as it plays to a stable coin that has mixed uh, pegs, like, um, for example, tethers tied to the dollar and to the gold. So which one steps in there at that point, the CFTC or SEC? And then relatedly, the uh, maybe the incongruence, the SEC's position that they won't approve the uh, crypto ETF uh, because it's not security, but at the same time, they might want to regulate crypto as a security. Uh, so just curious about your thoughts there. You know, I think, uh, I think that here the, uh, the jurisdictional question is very much bound up with the idea of the definition of crypto and the different types more particularly the different types of cryptocurrencies. Uh, I wrote a paper a long time ago uh, called Synthetic Commodity Money, which was a, inspired by Bitcoin. Uh, the only reason I mention it is because there I took the view that, that, uh, that Bitcoin resembles in many ways a, a commodity, a, a, a strange commodity. And I think that it still does so. And, and for that reason, uh, it's logical to treat it so for regulatory purposes. It doesn't, it's not a financial instrument in the sense of being a promise to pay anything else. It's not a redeemable claim. It's not, it doesn't resemble a security in any of those respects, uh, uh, at least not a debt security. So I, uh, uh, I think that uh, for it and for other uh, free-floating cryptos that are not uh, pegged uh, the CFTC's position uh, that it should be handling these things makes a certain amount of sense but when you turn to things like stable coins particularly redeemable stable coins which are much more like uh, money market funds or even bank deposits then, of course, uh, there's a stronger case for the SEC being involved, uh, but there's a, equally a, a case for uh, involvement by the Federal Reserve and uh, other uh, uh, payment system, dollar payment system regulators. And so, uh, so basically my point is that depending on which kind of cryptocurrency we're talking about, the claims uh, of these different regulators who are fighting for that turf uh, might be uh, 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 legitimized. But certainly it, it probably wouldn't make sense for any one of them to be given jurisdiction over every sort of cryptocurrency. I, yeah, I agree with all that. And I also want to add a little bit of the just additional perspective that the way we do it in the United States, where we say we have securities regulation under one agency, and we have the regulation of commodities and derivatives uh, under another agency. There is no other country in the world that does it that way. There is no need for us to even be talking about the existence of this regulatory turf battle in the first place. Yeah. All right. Next question. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I work in the, the attorney general's office here in Florida. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the traceability of cryptocurrency transactions. And I'll, I'll give a hypothetical for the young lawyers in the room. You know, partner walks into the office and says, our client came in yesterday and they told us that they were just scammed in a, in a transaction. And uh, they lost a lot of money and they're really upset. And it turns out they paid for this transaction in cryptocurrency. 
what do we do? How do we figure out like what happened with the money? Uh, what tools do we need to use? How quickly do we need to act? Who do we need to call to try to do something about it? I think Sujit. that's when you hire Sujit. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I'm not going to sound totally self-serving here. but uh, So my company is a blockchain analytics company. And what we do is essentially help trace illicit transactions on, on the blockchain. So again, I, I'm not just going to hawk my company, but there are other companies out there whose business it is to essentially assist people like you and your clients. If you have a problem with money being stolen, should you know call the attorney general's office, obviously you should alert law enforcement. Either they will engage us or you can engage us directly. And essentially we will create a, a trace map of where the money went. And then obviously law enforcement can sort of use that to either subpoena particular information or figure out where the funds have gone. And then again, either we can help assist in seizing those assets or obviously law enforcement can get directly involved as well. So the, the, the short answer is what you have described is actually is exactly what has created the market opportunity for companies like ours. That, that's a short response. Great. Um, if you have more questions, come on up. I think um, to piggyback on that, though, um, I'd be interested. A few months ago, uh, we saw the Canadian truckers try to use cryptocurrency because they were being shut down by their government. And then their cryptocurrency wallets were also shut down. I think they were placed on the Canadian version of OFAC's sanctions list. So is how do you deal with the double-edged sword of freedom to transact instantly and irreversibly, and yet the freedom for a government to put you on a a no fly list for money just because they don't like your political views and maybe professor hill if you want to hook that into the first amendment as well um so i think that as a baseline it's important to understand that the supreme court has held that you do not have a fourth amendment privacy interest in your bank account the reason being that you've given that information to a third party, so you must not care about keeping it, it private to yourself. So um, this is what courts are dealing with when similar questions about Fourth Amendment come up in the cryptocurrency context, right? So do you have a right to privacy in your Coinbase wallet? Well, how is that any different than your Bank of America account? Well, what about the blockchain? Well, you just heard that it's public and Sujit can trace it. Um, how do we have a right to privacy in that? Um, now, that's what the Supreme Court has said. Of course, I don't teach constitutional law because I like areas of law where there's, you know, law. Um, <laughs> So I suppose, you know, a different Supreme Court with a different makeup um, could conclude that things are different, um, especially in the era where we do so much of our lives online. I think that perhaps it might make sense to think about um, whether these old cases about what we expect in terms of privacy are reflective of the world in which we live in today, but that's sort of of the rub. But if you conclude that there's no Fourth Amendment or privacy issues, it's a very small jump to say, well, it, it, then we know what you've done and we can tell you not to do it anymore. Um, in fact, uh, there are, no, not just to be the China fear monger, but there are, uh, China's had some runs at their banks. And one of the things that um, was happening is that people were going to the banks to stand outside to protest or to try to get their money out. Um, and they all have on their phones uh, COVID travel uh, things that show if you've been exposed and then you're supposed to stay in your room. Well, turns out all these folks going to protest at banks suddenly um, were told that they didn't have a travel passport for COVID. And, and there are suggestions that the reason for this is because not that they'd had COVID, but because they were, were trying to shut this down. So I think it's a worry. Um, and I'm not sure that existing Fourth Amendment jurisprudence goes much, goes very far to protect us on that front. Any other thoughts? All right, next question. So Professor Hill, your, your answer about the First Amendment 
prompted a, a ton of other questions for me because, um, you know, you can think of a lot in the DeFi space that is obviously unlawful yet extremely popular and we don't really know who published the contracts. Tornado obviously violates money laundering and the Patriot Act. Curve, Uni, both definitely violate the Commodity Futures Act. Um, and you could go on and on about these things that are just plainly unlawful, but nevertheless were, are published on the blockchain. So if I understand your First Amendment argument, maybe I don't, but I, I think it'd be interesting to understand. I mean, do you think that Congress and the government has the right to go arrest the people who publish the code that enables these things. I mean, there, there are potentially lawful uses of it for some people in some jurisdictions, but obviously for any American interacting with it, it's definitely an unlawful service that that dev has published on the blockchain. Nevertheless, the dev can't take it off the blockchain anymore. So how, how do you see that working out? I mean, I think... It's a thorny issue. I think that law enforcement somewhere is going to decide that they have the authority to shut it down. Um, whether they have the practical means to shut it down right now is a thorny question, too. Although that can change over time, right? In the early days of Bitcoin, the thought of being able to trace it the way that analytic sperms can do today was just sort of unthinkable, I think. Um, if we go back even further than that, you know, online gambling proliferated for years and years, and then all of a sudden the government just decided no more. Um, so I think that things that seem difficult um, and unthinkable and hard today might not necessarily seem so outlandish tomorrow. I think already Bitcoin is much more regulated and the whole crypto space is much more regulated than um, people in the beginning ever thought possible. Right. So I have a bit of a theoretical question um, and I think I may have discussed this with a couple of you when we were setting up the panel, but in you know bringing it full circle to this concept of government monopoly over the money supply, in the theoretical world where Bitcoin or some other virtual currency becomes so widely adopted by consumers and merchants that it actually becomes a preferred medium of exchange and Congress perceives harm to the dollar, do you think Congress has authority, you know, through its constitutional authority to regulate the money supply to just outright ban virtual currencies as a medium of exchange on the basis that they have to do it because it's necessary and proper to protect the dollar or the money supply? Well, it's a legal question, so I'm uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit uh, leery of uh, of providing a, an answer to it directly, except to say that my understanding of the Constitution is it gives Congress the right to uh, coin money and uh, regulate the value thereof, but it doesn't by itself uh, preclude people from using other things as money. It does. There have been laws since that have put barriers on the production of alternatives, uh, of various kinds of alternatives, but uh, there's nothing on the books that, uh, that rules out uh, or makes illegal the adoption of something like Bitcoin, as far as I'm aware. And, uh, and nothing that would rule it out or, or, or make it illegal if it were to be really a serious rival to the dollar or any other currency, which it isn't yet. It isn't yet, let's be clear. It call, it's, we call it cryptocurrency, but it's not current in, that, in the sense of being widely used. But um, uh, I don't think there's anything in the law. I would like to, uh, to, to say that um, uh, that doesn't mean there aren't reasons to be concerned about such a possibility. Uh, if, if Bitcoin were to become extremely uh, popular as a medium of exchange, even for ordinary payments, if that were to happen, then we have to consider several possible ways it could happen. As long as uh, the, uh, its popularity didn't prevent dollars from continuing to be valued and used as a, a, along with it as a 
as a parallel currency, then uh, the Federal Reserve would retain control of dollars. And if dollars were still the most common medium in which prices were expressed, it would be able to exercise monetary policy. In fact, it's mainly that second fact, uh, whether a currency is used as the main medium of account, that matters for the regulators of that currency to engage in meaningful macroeconomic policy. So you could have people using Bitcoin very extensively, but as long as prices are expressed in US dollars and there's still some demand for them, you could still have the Federal Reserve meet its mandates, if it knew how, <laughs> um, which of course is a question. The, the, uh, uh, the other possibility, another possibility is that Bitcoin becomes so wildly uh, preferred, so completely preferred to dollars, that dollars cease to be demanded at all, and everybody wants to set their prices in terms of Bitcoin. And here we come back to one of the original points made before. We need to return to the basic concepts of market failure in assessing what we should think about a situation like that, right? Uh, it's not a question of monetary sovereignty. It's not a question of, oh, we must have a dollar by hook or by crook. And it isn't, uh, again, a case where the Constitution says we have to have a dollar by hook or by crook. It just says that Congress can authorize the creation of official dollars. So then the question becomes, if everyone prefers Bitcoin, <clears throat> sets prices according to them, et cetera, et cetera, according to it, well, what would that mean for how would the public be harmed? And the answer then would depend on whether Bitcoin is a desirable currency or not. And we have to wonder why the people would adopt it generally in preference to dollars unless it is so. What externality could cause people to all try to use dollars as their medium of account and means of payment? If in, I mean, use Bitcoin for those purposes. If in fact there was a bad medium of payment and a bad unit of account. Personally, I don't think Bitcoin will ever take over from the dollar because I don't think that the structure of the thing, particularly the fixed supply that it'll eventually reach, uh, will make it a particularly attractive accounting unit or uh, an attractive currency. And the second point, the costs involved are problematic, even with things like lightning. Uh, but if it were to happen, I think we'd have to ask whether it's happening for good reason. And that could be the case, for example, if the dollar is extremely badly regulated, if the Federal Reserve cannot control inflation, there would probably be, there would presumably be uh, such a bad dollar that that switch would be better even if it were not ideal. So um, that's the kind of question, those are the kinds of issues we'd have to address in, in, in addressing that kind of question. All right, we've got time for one last very quick question. I have a question regarding the legitimacy of crypto, not just as a medium of exchange, but as an asset class. When we look at things like Tether and how it, there's a lot of lawsuits that are going on that Tether has lied about being backed with US dollars a one-to-one -one ratio. There have been the absolute and total collapse of quote unquote stable coins. We've seen exchanges like Coinbase and others, as crypto markets have declined, they have locked out the user accounts that have prevented further sell offs and engaging in really just market manipulation in a lot of ways. And then you look at the other side of the market. We saw the explosion in values of crypto as we saw the simultaneous explosion in the money supply by the Federal Reserve, by central banks worldwide. As interest rates have gone up, every single time that the Federal Reserve has announced rising interest rates, we have seen mass sell-offs of cryptocurrency. As the money supply has dried up, crypto has been hit the most out of all of the asset classes, whether that's stocks, whether that's housing, crypto has gone down the most. Don't all of these points strongly suggest that crypto is just one giant Ponzi scheme? No. <laughs> um, so that's like saying doesn't this suggest that selling shares of a company is one giant ponzi scheme well 
No, like the the fundamentals of different coins really matter. And so the Terra Luna proposition is in fact meaningfully different from Circle, which is meaningfully different from ETH or from Bitcoin. And so what you're seeing, I think, is um, an inflation in money supply where there's too much capital. Um, and so you're seeing big capital swings that do hinge on Fed rate announcements, which I think um, to George's point here, it it hasn't always been that way and it, it doesn't have to be that way. But if you look over the last four years, uh, Bitcoin has done significantly better than most stocks and than the US dollar. Although the US dollar is also doing much better, it hit parity with the euro right now. So I think it's it's tempting to want to oversimplify these things, but um, it's it's actually very diverse. Um, if anyone else has a quick closing thought. Yeah, I guess to, to jump in there, I'll say, one, I actually agree that there probably is too much Ponzi economic type stuff happening within the crypto world, but that's not to say that the underlying technology, right, the blockchain doesn't have value, especially, and, and that value could get certainly built on over time. Uh, the last thought would be, look, something may or may not be a good investment, but that doesn't mean it's appropriate to remove people's freedom of choice, right? Like there are all kinds of stocks that are also like totally just crap investments. But we say, look, here are the rules, like the issuer of that stock needs to provide all this information to the market. And we trust that the market will internalize that information and ultimately make good decisions about which companies are worth investing in and which one should fall by the wayside. Um, certainly, there's there are no disclosure requirements in, in the crypto world. And I think there are definitely parts of the crypto world that could benefit from those kinds of requirements, right? Not exactly in the way the SEC does it for stocks, but in, in an appropriately tailored way for crypto. But yeah, I guess I would say, yeah, there's some bad stuff. We can concede that point. That doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bat luck. With the bat luck. Thank you all very much. I don't mean to cut this short, but we have so much more to go through. <laughs>